So today I've got a really special guest. I've got Dr. Steve Anstrip, who's been working with us at Polar Bears International for a number of years, and lead senior scientist, um, who's actually thinking about trying to take some time off. We're not sure we're gonna let that happen exactly, but he, we're, we're, he's talking about it, and he's, he's making a good argument. But I had always heard this story about how he came to be a part of, of PBI, and I wanna share that with you guys. Got him in the truck. Since he's captive, we're going to talk to him a little bit about how he came to be such an important part of Polar Bears International. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, the, the intro is great because, yeah, you do have me as a captive. <laughs> Unless you can't stop, I can't get away. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I spent 30 years in Alaska studying polar bears, and the timing of my uh, coming into the polar bear world was really fortuitous in one way, and that was that I got to see polar bears in their prime in the early, mid 80s, and even into the early 90s when things were really looking good. My early work documented that uh, polar bears in Alaska had recovered from the over harvest that had occurred in the 60s and 70s. And so it was really exciting. But then, uh, by the late 90s, we were seeing the habitat just change in a way that, if, if you had told me in 1980 when I first went up to Alaska that, uh, that I was going to see that kind of change, I would have said you were crazy. When I first went up there, the early years, I could stand on the beach in northern Alaska and the sea ice in the summertime at its maximum retreat would still be right there. I could see it. Yeah. Now, it's hundreds of miles offshore beyond the curvature of the earth. You know, late August and September, you can't see the ice at all. So, tremendous amount of change, and our work showed that that change was impacting polar bears. And wasn't that the science that was used during the George W. Bush administration, that they made a decision to list polar bears on the yeah, as an endangered yeah. species of special concern? Well, or? no, it's listed as a threatened species. Uh -huh. uh, and there are still a number of polar bears, and there are polar bears living in places that are still doing all right. But our work showed that we could lose two-thirds of the world's bears by the middle of this century. That's only 30 years from now. Uh, if we continued on the greenhouse gas emissions path, we could lose them all by the end of the century. That even though we still have a lot of research questions that we could answer. It was clear to me by 2010 that if we don't halt global warming, if we don't halt the decline in the sea ice, that none of those other things really matter. Well, so you're basically saying <clears throat> you, as a scientist, were studying them for 30 years. You found out lots and lots of great information. You needed now to take this information out and get it to the people and is, is that, was that the impetus yeah, for joining that, that, Polar Bears International? That really was, that, uh, you know, we, it was clear to me that if we didn't get a handle on global warming, we were gonna lose polar bears. I had, at that time, enough service time in with the federal government that I could retire. And so I thought, you know, I need to take advantage of the wisdom that I gathered over 30 years mm -hmm. and try and get it out to the public, try and get it out mm -hmm. to policymakers. I was looking for an avenue that would allow me to do that, and Polar Bears International was the perfect avenue. Uh, mainly an education or an education and outreach organization, mm -hmm. although we do at Polar Bears International do a considerable amount of research. Right. Uh, but the biggest uh, impact I believe that we have is the information and education sector, and that was perfect because when I was with the government, we weren't really supposed to talk about conservation. Right. It was all about the research and hoping somebody else might use it for conservation. Well, now we are. And that's the real avenue uh, and the uh, opportunity that uh, Polar Bears International offered. And, you know, the other side of it is that I think I've helped PBI develop a really good succession plan yeah. that will carry PBI far into the future. In response to that, you have John Whiteman, Flavio. Flavio. Um, There's this. Ptarmigan, by the way. Oh, Ptarmigan. Oh, look at that. Wow, the wind is just howling. Okay, so the road show is... Oh, look at right here, Dan. Nice. They're getting gravel. They're getting picking grit. gravel. Yeah. Those guys are beautiful. They're getting ready to go. Let me see if I can get a... Let's see if I can get this. Cool. Boy, you don't see them that close very often. You no. Right. And it was a lot of fun to see these young guys becoming part of the organization. 
I'm really excited. Younger guys getting to, getting at younger people, and that's what we need. So yeah, no yeah. more old old fogies. Old like guys me. like or me. I'm right. I'm <laughs> catching you. You're not a, you're not a lot further ahead than me. We'll uh, put this together and get this out to people, and maybe they'll get a little better idea of why you got involved. Anyway, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. You're the first guest I've had on Digital Dan's Rambling Roadshow interview tour. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm honored. Okay. Yeah.